So our next presenter will be um, Dr. Julie Gould, and she'll be talking on biocontrol, and she's also at our Forest Pest Methods Lab in uh, Massachusetts. So here I'll set Julie. Um, great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, so uh, I'm giving this talk. I'm working with uh, Hannah Broadley and Winka Wu, who um, is a molecular biologist, and we all work together at the Forest Pest Methods Lab in um, Massachusetts. And we very early on um, asked the question, is spotted lanternfly a good candidate for classical biological control? And classical biocontrol is really um, used when a pest is not native, check has been established for at least five years, yep, causing economic or ecological damage or eradication and control by other means is not possible. And quite honestly, we didn't wait for these criteria to be met because we're kind of meeting that right about now. Um, biological control takes a really long time. So you can't wait until it's desperately needed before you get started looking. Um, and after my experience with emerald ash borer, I was honestly quite doubtful that spotted lanternfly was going to be eradicated. So we got going um, quite a number of years ago. Um, and this is where we are now. If you look at this um, list of steps in classical biological control, we're on steps two through five. That's where we're working right now. We're surveying for native natural enemies. Uh, doing foreign exploration, um, selecting potential biocontrol agents, and also importing and studying them in quarantine. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the first thing you want to do is you want to see if there are any native natural enemies that are acting that could control the population. You don't need to bring any in if there's already um, something here that could be doing a good job. And we have had some anecdotal evidence and, and just examples of um, some parasitoids attacking particularly the eggs of spotted lanternfly. Uh, Ho-Ping Lu has published about finding Owen Sirtis cuvani, which is a uh, um, parasitoid of Lymantria dispar. Um, we've seen signs of an Anastatus-like wasp. Um, this picture here uh, shows uh, one of those wasps on a spotted lanternfly egg in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We sometimes find these egg masses that have holes that look like the emergence holes of Anastatus wasps. So we decided to do a really big survey. And if you look at the map on this slide, all of these dots are sites where there had been some report of there being uh, some sort of activity by parasitoids. So in 2021, we collected 720 egg masses from these sites. Well, only four wasps emerged. And when we dissected some, we found another two. So the bottom line is spotted lanternfly is not being controlled by native parasitoids. And we do need to pursue classical biological control. Um, foreign exploration began in 2015. Our colleagues in China, um, some of which are shown here doing some collecting, um, they explored in 27 provinces or administrative regions and they found spotted lanternfly in 22 of the 27 provinces. Um, you can see that the provinces in red um, in kind of mid-central China, these are where the densities of SLF were the highest. And by high, we mean high for Asia, not high like you see in Pennsylvania. Um, and what we collected, wherever you see an A, is where we found a parasitoid called Anastatus orientalis, and wherever you see a D, we collected a parasitoid called Dryanus sinicus. And I'm gonna introduce you to them now. Um, Anastatus orientalis is an egg parasitoid seen on the left. It's in the family Eupelmidae. And Dryanus sinicus is one of the most interesting insects I've ever met. It's so fascinating. And I will talk about it a little later. I'm going to talk about Anastatus first. Um, so 
Anastatus is an egg parasitoid, and it was hypothesized that it had a two generation per year life cycle. It was thought by our Chinese collaborators that in the fall, when spotted lanternfly females are laying their eggs, uh, Anastatus will parasitize those freshly laid eggs. They will then enter a winter diapause. It was then thought that they emerge in the spring, but that they emerge prior to spotted lanternfly hatch. They then parasitize these unhatched eggs, producing another generation, which then estivates during the summer and then parasitizes spotted lanternfly um, in the fall. Now, it's really important for host specificity, which we all know is the key for biocontrol. Um, and it's very important that this be true because if Anastatus is emerging at a time when spotted lanternfly egg masses are not available, either it's a dead end um, or they require another host. So that would be somewhat problematic for a biocontrol project. So we decided to study the life cycle of Anastatus. And what we did was we collected egg masses in China and had them shipped to the United States in the spring. We reared these egg masses under conditions. We, we put them in growth chambers and we set the growth chambers to match the 11 year average temperatures for both the collection site in China, but also for Pottstown, Pennsylvania, which was in Berks County, which at the time was where the um, spotted lanternfly infestation was most prevalent. And we also simulated the day length that they experienced. Uh, we checked emergence every two to three days. We recorded when spotted lanternfly hatched and the parasitoids emerged. Uh, we held the parasitoids for one week for mating. And then we set up five females and a male in a cup with a spotted lanternfly egg mass, gave them another one two weeks later, another one two weeks later for a total of six weeks with three egg masses. And we repeated this for, for subsequent generations. And things started out pretty well um, in terms of our hypotheses. Um, the red line on these graphs show the emergence pattern of Anastatus orientalis females. The blue line shows the emergence pattern of spotted lanternfly um, nymphs. And you can see that under both Beijing conditions and Pennsylvania conditions, the female parasitoids did emerge first. They did have an opportunity to parasitize spotted lanternflies that were yet unhatched. But the window wasn't huge. It was about 10 days. And the wasps do have a three-day pre-oviposition period. Um, and so um, the one th little piece that's missing, by the way, <laughs> that we need to study is whether or how close to hatch parasitoids can attack spotted lanternfly. We haven't actually tested that yet. And those, um, those studies are in the works. So this is what we saw in 2019. I don't have a graph, but we saw exactly the same thing in 2020. The parasitoids did come out first. Um, but then we started seeing some things that were rather concerning. Um, I'm going to show a series of these graphs, so let me quickly walk you through them. Um, on the y-axis, you have the, the generations. P is parental, their progeny is the F1, then the F2, then the F3 generation. Um, the, uh, along the bottom is the timeline uh, in, in months, and the Blue bars show what happened under Beijing conditions or the conditions that simulated China, and the yellow bars show what happened under Pennsylvania conditions. So in 2019, we had a spring emergence. The emergence in Pennsylvania was delayed relative to what we saw in Beijing. Not too surprising, it's warmer in Beijing. But then we had a... a a very unexpected thing happened. We actually got a generation in the summer. In July, we saw emergence under both Beijing and Pennsylvania conditions. The progeny under Beijing conditions went on to have an F2 generation in the fall, 45% of which emerged, but then it got too cold. And the remaining wasps of the F2 generation emerged in the spring, the progeny of the F2 also emerged in the spring. 
But the really disconcerting thing also was there was no fall generation under Pennsylvania conditions. This is where we would want to be doing biocontrol and nothing emerged in the fall at all. So that was um, very surprising and rather disconcerting. And so we decided to repeat it. And lo and behold, everything was as predicted, as hypothesized. We even held them for another full year and we got a spring generation, a fall generation, spring generation, fall generation under both Beijing and Pennsylvania conditions. No sign whatsoever of a, of a summer generation. So whew, what to make of that? Um, well, one of the things we had decided after 2019 was that perhaps Beijing wasn't very well climate matched to Pennsylvania. So when we did climate matching, if you look here, this is where Beijing is. It's in kind of the gold color. And um, the, um, the darker orange is more well matched to Pennsylvania. And there's a city in China called Yantai. It's out on the tip of this uh, peninsula. It's a better match to Pen Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And also we had collaborators there who were, were very good. And so we were able to repeat this study, but with collections from Yantai. So uh, starting in 2020, we again repeated this. And again, we saw something that was quite surprising. Uh, I tell you, Anastatus is never ceased to amaze us. Um, so in Yantai, under both Pennsylvania and Yantai conditions, the spotted lanternfly in blue hatched well before we got any emergence of the parasitoids. Any parasitoids emerging in the spring would not be attacking SLF under these conditions. They would either have a dead end or need an alternate host. And the thing that was even stranger was that under Yantai conditions, we only got about 13% of the hatch that we were going to see in the spring. The other 87% all emerged in the fall. This was a full year of development that they took. They, these, these parasitoids had entered the spotted lanternfly in the fall of 2019. So a full year for development. Um, and so if you look at, again, the life cycles that we created, again, we see emergence under um, the parental generation, only 13% of them under Yantai conditions emerged in the spring, the rest emerged in the fall. Under Pennsylvania conditions, only had a spring emergence, no fall emergence. This parental fall generation had no spring progeny at all. All of the progeny emerged a year later. Um, the, the progeny of this, these parentals that were in F1, most of those took a full year to develop. And in fact, the Pennsylvania F1 generation emerged so late in November, that was it. It was too cold. We never got any more development of um, the, that generation. It just petered out. Uh, we, we repeated this in 2021. Um, it's obviously still a bit early to know the full results, but this time it was a little different. We did get um, the, uh, a fall generation, um, uh, a fall F1 generation under Pennsylvania conditions. So why are we seeing such varying emergence periods? You know, what is going on? Is it, is it just natural variability? Are they that plastic that they can just diapause and not diapause and come out at all sorts of different times, depending on environmental conditions? Or is there genetic variability? And spoiler alert, uh, it's actually both. Uh, we certainly know that environmental conditions had a profound effect on the timing of wasp emergence. You know, wasps collected both in Beijing and in Yantai emerged at very different times when held under native range or Pennsylvania conditions. But the, we're talking about field populations. This, these are, you know, we were doing groups of insects, not single lines of insects. And so the question was, are the populations homogeneous to, genetically or are there biotypes or cryptic species? And Winka Wu in our lab um, 
came on board and he found that there are at least six haplotypes of um, Anastatus orientalis found in China. Uh, three of these are very common, haplotypes B, C, and D. B is only found in Yantai. Um, there is no B in Beijing. Um, groups C and D are also found in Yantai, but um, biotype B is the dominant one in Yantai. Um, and the divergence between some of these groups is quite high, like 1.4%, which could be considered species level differences. And just so you know, our colony, it turned out was pure. We did have a colony and we tested it and it's pure haplotype C. So the tests I'm gonna to talk to you about in a minute were done with haplotype C. Well, so we saw this genetic difference. Does that mean that they're different biologically? And the answer is yes, they are. Uh, one of the things that's very important to us is that we be able to rear a continuous colony. We want to be able to do testing and host specificity testing and to do it constantly, not to have to wait for them to develop six months or a year. So we created what we call isofemale lines and we got haplotypes B, C, and D in pure colony. And we reared them under three different types of conditions. One was 25 degrees C long day, which in the literature out of Korea was the rearing conditions they used. We used conditions that we call Beijing fall. It's conditions that simulate the middle of September in Beijing. And we use match conditions. This is where we change the temperature every single day to match what's going on in the field. And we already knew that type C did not real rear well at all at 25 degrees C long day. We already knew that. And in our new test, that was exactly what we found. We found we had to use these Beijing fall conditions. Haplotype D though, didn't really seem to care. It did absolutely fine. It didn't go into diapause under either of those conditions. Haplotype B on the other hand, um, it didn't come out under any conditions. Um, they are still, in fact, in diapause as we speak. So there absolutely were biological differences between these haplotypes, and we will be studying them further. Um, so host specificity testing um, is really, really important. We need to ensure that if we're going to do a release, that they attack the target insect and don't have a big impact on non-target organisms. When we started our testing, we selected 11 priority species for testing. We wanted to look at plant hoppers from the East Coast that were large bodied, uh, had one generation a year like spotted lanternfly, overwintered as eggs, and laid eggs on the above ground portions of the plants. Um, however, some preliminary tests on squash bug eggs and a, and a silk moth showed there was some non-target parasitism. So we expanded our testing to look at a much broader range of species. And this is what we found. Um, if you look at the orange line, this is the number of progeny, parasitoid progeny that are produced on spotted lanternfly. And you can see that especially for some of these big silk moths, the, um, the number of progeny produced was pretty high. This is Cecropia. This, in fact, right here is brown marmorated stink bug. We have Luna moths, we have Prometheus moths, Polyphemus moths, who oh boy. So, and one of the things that we noticed too was that size of the egg really did matter because if the eggs were really big, like the spotted lanternfly, Publicia, that's another Fulgorid, or any of these um, Saturnids, the Anastatus would produce females. When the um, eggs were smaller, they sometimes only produced male progeny, but they would still attack them. So the next step in this process is, you know, we, we were forcing them in no choice tests to attack or, or don't reproduce. So the next step is always a choice test where you um, put put the um, non-target in with the target and ask in the presence of the target, will they still attack the non-target? And we have the upper 
uh, darker orange line is the, the rate of attack of SLF in the no choice tests and the lighter orange line is the attack rate in choice tests. Well, for most of the species, the attack rate did decline in the no choice tests, with the exception of polyphemus. The attack rate actually went up in the choice tests. And we still did get a considerable number of progeny being produced on these, um, especially on these silk moths. And um, we feel that given how important silk moths are, and especially how under attack they are from Compsalura consonata, a Lamentria dispar, um, parasitoid Ranamak, um, it is very unlikely that haplotype C is sufficiently host specific. Uh, to be uh, released. And we are now um, going to be testing haplotypes D and B. Um, so for future research on Anastatus or Antalus in the US, um, some of the things we're going to be looking at in the future are determining how close to hatch SLF eggs can be attacked. Uh, we're going to be doing host specificity testing of haplotypes B and D. In fact, D is already underway. Uh, we now have pure colonies, so we're going to look at their life cycles um, without the um, uh, confounding factor of haplotypes. We're going to do the life cycle study again with the pure lines, and we really need to figure out how to shorten up the generation time of haplotype B, because we, we can't be working with something that takes a full year to develop. And I'd like to mention briefly some of the work we're doing in Korea on biocontrol. Um, spotted lanternfly was invasive in Korea, and they also collaborated with the same people in China to collect and rear and release Anastatus orientalis. Um, and they released parasitoids in 2017. And there's been some anecdotal evidence that populations of SLF have declined in Korea, but really nobody knows why or has studied it. So we are setting up some life table studies with the Koreans. Um, one of the really interesting things, though, is most of the parasitoids in Korea are haplotype D, not haplotype C like we tested, but haplotype D. And if you look at two of the papers that came out of Korea, one of the papers, um, Sao et al. 2019, found that a continuous colony of Anastatus was maintained at 25 degrees C with a long day life cycle. Well, under those conditions, haplotype C enters diapause. So they probably were very much looking at haplotype D. The other thing that was really interesting is they tried very hard to find an alternate host. They tried rearing it on brown marmorated stink bug. They tried several silk moths they could not rear it on anything other than spotted lanternfly. And the, what they ended up doing was rearing them on immature anthrae pernii, which is a silk moth. But when I say immature, I mean immature. I mean, they, they actually would dissect the pupae and take the um, unlaid eggs out of the pupa. And once the eggs were laid, they could not use them for rearing. So fingers crossed that perhaps uh, but haplotype D is indeed more host specific. Um, so in 2022, we're going to continue doing a lot of work in China, looking at uh, the life cycle in the field, um, doing some work looking at non-targets in the field to see if Anastatus is using them under natural conditions, um, and continuing to look in China for more haplotypes. Uh, to see if there might be more haplotypes that could be um, investigated for biocontrol of um, spotted lanternfly. So now I come to Dryanus cynicus, which, as I said, is one of the most interesting insects I've ever uh, encountered. It's native to China. It has one generation a year, and it attacks the nymphs. And if you look at this picture here, this is a female. She's got really, really long legs and these marvelous pincers on the end, which she uses to, to grab a hold of the spotted lanternfly nymphs. And they not only lay eggs on the spotted lanternfly, but they also host feed. But when they parasitize, they parasitize the nymph under the wing pad. 
And the larva of the parasitoid develops in this brown sac. You can see one here on the spotted um, lanternfly nymph. This is the developing parasitoid. It's developing external to, um, the, to the nymph. And I'll tell you, rearing this, <laughs> this parasitoid is very difficult. It has this one generation per year. You know, we collect nymphs in the field and ship them, but then we have to chill them. They do require a chill period. Uh, it requires that we rear the host plants. We have to rear the spotted lanternfly nymphs. We have to make sure we have conditions that induce mating and overposition. And um, it's been quite a challenge. Uh, the Alanthus propagation, we at first were getting some poor germination, uh, but fortunately we've overcome that. We used some methods of cold stratification and um, soaking the seeds and grow, grow lights. And, so, and we also had a terrible outbreak of rust mites, uh, but we've in, uh, developed, discovered um, a miticide that does not hurt the uh, spotted lanternfly nymphs. And we've used that. And we are currently maintaining 200 elanthus plants. So fortunately we've overcome that challenge, but we have an even bigger challenge. And that is how to store the spotted lanternfly egg masses so that we can get nymphs out of them. We can store spotted lanternfly eggs for over a year, and they're perfectly suitable for Anastatus orientalis parasitism, no problem. But eggs stored beyond four months provide minimal nymphal hatch, and the nymphs that do hatch are really low vigor. We've tried storing at different temperatures and different humidities, and so far we have not been able to um, crack this nut. And we have a new scientist who just got her PhD and named Mari Hicken, and she is going to be tackling this problem for us. Um, and the other issue is we need conditions that are good for parasitism. We did get parasitism last year and we got 95 cocoons, but based on the size of the, those cocoons, they were all males, indicating a lack of mating. Um, the other problem we had under our conditions was we had a lot of multiple parasitism. You can see this poor nymph has three thylacium on it. Um, so super parasitism is not ideal when you're rearing. Um, so future goals with um, Dryanid is that we are going to try to induce mating prior to overposition, possibly in implementing a twilight period. Um, I just, this is not the best picture, but it's really cool of this parasitoid grabbing on uh, and, and parasitizing the spotted lantern, uh, spotted lantern fly nymph. Um, just thought I'd <laughs> put that in there. Um, and we, we need to produce a continuous colony and rearing these SLF nymphs from stored egg masses is really critical. Um, once we get all that in place, of course, there is the host range testing of Dryanus sinicus. And we are actually working uh, with Lisa Tewksbury at University of Rhode Island to start rearing some of these non-targets so that we know how to rear them. So in summary, um, few native Anastatus were found parasitizing spotted lanternfly in the US and no other notable native parasitoids were discovered. So classical biocontrol is appropriate for this species. Uh, the life cycle of Anastatus orientalis is variable can, depending on environmental conditions and genetics and it's not always synchronized with SLF egg availability. Um, we have found four to six haplotypes. Um, these are different biologically, at least the ones we've tested are. And we've studied each one separately in terms of life cycle and host specificity. Uh, haplotype C is not sufficiently host specific and we are currently testing haplotypes D and B. We are continuing to study the distribution of haplotypes and their impacts on SLF populations in Asia. And we hope to overcome the challenges of rearing Dryanus sinicus. Um, and we are currently trying to rear another generation um, as we speak. So fingers crossed that all this works uh, because we really need a solution to this um, very terrible problem. Ah! Um, so I will stop sharing my screen and take any questions.